Chapter 26 Sensei Hyped up real strong. That's how Amir and Chris showed up at the dojo. My whole team is crazy, Amir said. You should see these guys at practice trying to fuck each other up while we trying to run a practice game. We got three East New Yorkers and a couple of dudes from the hook. They be trying to settle beefs on the gym floor. I be telling them, look, sons, we on the same motherfucking team. How are we going to get this paper if y'all keep brawling? Amir had his arm stretched out. His eyes were excited. He loved that type of chaos, even though he knew it wasn't a winning strategy. He continued. Finally, Coach just told some bench riders, go guard the doors. Don't let nobody in. Then he made the East Duke it out with the hook. These kids was beating the shit out of one another. Slamming each other around like it wasn't nothing. I was straight laughing. I said, this ain't no fucking basketball team. Later, three kids from the East posted me up in the rusty ass locker room talking about, you a motherfucking perpetrator. Like I was supposed to jump in and hold them down cause I'm from the East too. I told them straight up, I ain't got no beef with the hook. Everybody in the East knows that out here on these streets, unless we bonded by blood or money, it's every man for himself. Oh, so we three is only bonded by money? Chris challenged. We brothers, we family. Y'all know how that go? Amir said. How's your team looking? I asked Chris. We all right, but we need that spark. That fire, you know, he said. Then you got to bring the heat. You be the spark. Let them rally around you. I amped him up truly believing that he did have what it takes to hold his own in a leadership position. Word to life, Amir agreed. Amir borrowed $25 from me. I'll give it back to you on Thursday night when we take the girls out, he promised. It ain't nothing, I told him. Yeah, I'm trying to get where you at, where $25 ain't nothing, he smiled. You could have borrowed against our car fund, Chris said like a real banker. Yeah, I could always borrow from our car fund, but the three of us can't fit on a mini bike together. If I keep borrowing from the car fund, that's what it's going to be. A motherfucking tricycle or a mini bike. We all cracked up laughing. Later that night, I practiced throwing my shuriken against the cork board in my room. I wasn't sure if Sensei was planning to test me at weapons training the next day. But if he did, I planned to be well prepared. Tuesday morning after Fajr prayer, I was on the move. I had to do business errands before my 12 o'clock weapons training class. I flew through the dojo doors in a hurry. Since they required all of his students to be on time. Once I got inside, the whole vibe switched up. Sensei's energy was calming. I slowed my breathing and put my belongings in the locker. Sensei had tea brewing, which was unusual. He seemed to want to talk. After we exchanged greetings, he said, Pour yourself some tea. Today we are going to begin by discussing vulnerabilities. The eyes, the larynx, the pelvis, the knees, the ankles, I said, assuring him that I had studied and retained the information. There was no need for review. Edis, he said, which is a Japanese word meaning very good. But today we are not focusing on physical vulnerabilities. We are focusing on emotional vulnerabilities. Just as a ninja must know where on the body to attack, he must also learn when is the best time to attack his opponent to achieve complete success. Sensei's use of the word success triggered a thought in me about Fozzie. Sensei-san, one question please. I said, when continued. We are here for weapons training. What would you say if another man said to you, that he works for a military weapons company and that he has weapons, which could completely wipe out your entire existence as though you were never ever born. Would it make you feel like everything we are doing here is nothing? It would reinforce my understanding of Sun Tzu's teaching. War is deception. You see, an opponent who can attack your mind and disable your confidence and skill has won before you have ever thrown one weapon, one kick, one fist. This person who flaunts his military superiority over you or your people is trying to immerse you in fear. He knows and they know that fear will guarantee their success and your defeat. 
They will have conquered you in your mind first to minimize their chances of losses on their end. And what if these deadly weapons they say they have are real, I ask. Most probably they are real. Men have devoted centuries worth of time to perfecting machines of destruction, bombs, missiles, even chemical warfare. Yet, even though some countries have these weapons, they have gone to war against people who have no fear of death, but have the spirit of determination, love of preserving their future, and the power of being on the right side of truth. When a mass of people has this, the training that I am offering you is the same training that they will need. If properly trained, people who seem to have no chance of victory can disarm their invaders, strip them of their weapons, and use their own weapons against them. They can even set traps, use the elements to their advantage, or appear to be passive while poisoning their opponents. For survival, they can do anything. This has happened before in Vietnam and Korea and other places. Let me recommend a book to you. He reached for his pad and pencil. He paused as if going back into his mind. He wrote down Dien Bien Phu by General Giap. In Vietnam and Korea, a lot of good men were defeated too. I supposed and asked at the same time while looking at the title of the book since they had written down on the paper for me. Yes, of course. In war, there are always losses. The victor is the one who can cut his losses when compared to the losses of his enemy and emerge with the possibility of rebuilding his team or village or civilization according to his beliefs, philosophies, culture, and interests, since they stated. A Buddhist friend of mine would ask, what is death? If the idea survives, then the dead live, since they smiled a rare smile. I heard the voice of my father woven in those words somewhere. Although my father, the scientist, was even more specific and precise. But since Sensei's words had components of what my father might say if he were standing right here, right now, I respected Sensei's opinion. It seemed that our talk motivated Sensei. He went about the two-hour training with intense enthusiasm and care. I listened intently when he taught me the importance of knowing when to attack an opponent. He described the man's emotional vulnerabilities as happiness, sadness, sexual arousal, and altered states of mind. Sensei said, if an attack can be properly planned and launched when a man's mind is altered by the emotion of happiness, for example, at the birth of his child or at the excitement of a sporting event or at a party. He is an easy, vulnerable target. Sensei said, if an attack can be properly planned and launched when a man's mind is altered by the emotion of sadness, for example, a funeral, or at the moment of great financial loss or during illness, he is an easy and vulnerable target. Sensei said, if an attack can be properly planned and launched when a man's mind is altered by the emotion and action of sexual arousal, for example, while watching a sexual display, pursuing sex or having sex, he is an easy and vulnerable target. Sensei said, if an attack can be launched while a man's mind is in a self-induced altered state, for example, while drinking alcohol, smoking opium or using drugs, his defeat by any ninja is certain. Sensei did not waste even one of his words on me. I listened. I understood. I locked them into my memory. After a half hour of talk, we went into action. I learned the art of the rope. Sensei instructed me on how to tie and bind a man in such a way that if a man tried to become untied, his own movements would cause him further injury instead of escape. It was deep. Sensei dragged out of his closet a life-size dummy to demonstrate. I watched him tie it down, each precise move, loop, and pull. He did it twice. Then he asked me to tie up the dummy in the same manner. As I got my chance, I replayed the process he used in my mind. 
It was as though I had Sensei's fingers caught in the close-up of a powerful movie camera lens. I tied the dummy the same way. I had seen Sensei tie it. My eyes were looking from the dummy to Sensei, from Sensei to the dummy. Yet, Sensei's silence made me doubt whether I had done it correctly. Breaking his silent pause, Sensei asks, What is the problem in this lesson? I thought for a moment. I kept staring at the dummy, looking for mistakes in my method. After careful review, I was sure that I tied it perfectly. Still, I paused. I admitted that I did not know the answer. Sensei answered for me. The problem here is that a ninja must always expect the unexpected. Therefore, the enemy who you are tying down will not be a dummy. Sensei pushed me with force, small hands, small man. Still, I fell from the force. It was my mind that was off guard. Your enemy will be trying to fight you, Sensei said, kicking me. I pulled my body out of his way. Yet, I was still on the floor at a disadvantage. Your enemy will be trying to destroy you to free himself, Sensei said, attacking. He will not be still like this dummy. He will be moving and responding to your every move, Sensei said, still striking me. Now I felt like the dummy. I got my head together to fight back against the master teacher. Within 13 minutes, he outfought me, had me down, constrained me, and then bound me to the chair. Then he smiled. You made two major mistakes, he said calmly, not even seeming like someone who had fought an opponent bigger and taller than himself for a prolonged amount of time. First, you failed to survive my sneak attack. Panic can have fatal consequences. Panic shuts down your thought process and renders you useless. He lifted up his teapot. Second, you showed your opponent too much respect and it led to your defeat. When you fight every time, you must think and move and fight to win. He had me sit there and tie it up while he poured himself a second cup of tea.